Burton seems like a fly on sugar to me. But there's an element of Sufism that perhaps was more attractive to him. Some Sufis inflict pain on themselves to test their focus on God to the extreme. In my fantasy, he was drawn to the s &M quality that these practices have. Certainly when he died in 1890, his body was covered with strange scars, thought to be from Sufi ceremonies. I'm not sure what Burton would have made of this slightly circus-like troupe. I do imagine he was very much into um, exploring his pain threshold. That certainly rang true. Uh, I think one of the things that, that is extraordinary about his period and our period, vis-à-vis -vis army and war and all that kind of stuff, is how they were just dying to get into a scrap. It's just a totally different attitude to death and pain. And so I imagine he enjoyed very much um, you know, having knives put through him as indeed do several uh, queens from Berlin that I know. Uh, I think they'd have a lovely time in a group of Sufis. <laughs> Burton's fascination with Sufism and delight in disguise had awakened new interests and perhaps desires. By now he'd crossed a line and would never be able to turn back. Rumours about his tastes were now rife. He was sick, out of favour, but he was already dreaming up a new journey. After seven years in India, Richard Burton, half dead from cholera, malaria, uh, malnutrition, ophthalmia, you name it, he got it, limps home on the good ship Eliza, already with a new plan in his mind, in disguise, pitching himself against an unlawful entry into Mecca. After four years of planning back in England, Burton was going to Arabia and into the heart of Islam. He believed that as a Westerner, he couldn't really get close to Arab culture. He wanted to immerse himself deeper than ever before. In 1853, he left Burton the Englishman behind and boarded the train for Southampton as an Arab Muslim. He was going on the Hajj, the Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca, in disguise. If discovered as an infidel, he would be killed immediately. His goal was to experience the culture and religion from the inside out. You do feel a journey in, in Richard Burton, and you feel it from, just as an amateur looking on, uh, you feel the journey from him going to India as a rather gung-ho officer, and little by little kind of discovering himself and discovering what he really liked as opposed to what his acted character, you know, the English officer, was meant to like. But what was this newly liberated Burton searching for in the Arab world? Something spiritual? Sex? Pain? Knowledge? Or was he just the ultimate escapologist, running away from himself? Richard Govan is one of those intriguing characters one comes across in faraway places. Anthropologist, convert to Islam, and Burton fan. OK, so we're now getting into an area that wouldn't have been too dissimilar from where Burton lived when he came here. Burton stayed in Egypt undercover for several weeks to perfect his Arabic, and he got down and dirty with the locals. He even set himself up as a quack doctor in a poor area just like this so he could study the natives up close. Burton didn't want to present himself as a convert. He was trying for something far more difficult and dangerous, to convince as a Muslim born and bred. His method acting knew no bounds. He even cut off his foreskin. He would have been discovered otherwise. I mean, he, he was going on a, a long, exhausting journey where, which sometime or other he would have been seen naked by people. And he says explicitly that he, um, he wanted to go undercover as somebody that was, already, that was born Muslim, rather than, rather than a convert. Because converts are always the object of suspicion. So, um, Burton was uh, an anthropologist, yeah. and you're an anthropologist. Burton was not an anthropologist as, as I am an anthropologist. The point of anthropology these days is to be an observer, um, that 
owns up to the involvement rather than making yourself the star of the piece. Right. Burton always had to be the star of the piece. He was the narrator mm. um, hero. And uh, that's why we love him. He took on the, the, the bodily, he, he took on the clothes, he took on everything. He took on even the, uh, the way of walking, of being, of sounding, as much as he could. Now, um, for a Victorian gentleman of that day, those kind of compromises would have gone against the grain of, of, of being an Englishman. Staying in character all the time, Burton hung out in coffee houses, bath houses, and bazaars, trying to discern the slightest variations in custom and gesture. Throughout Burton's travels, he realized that um, people don't walk the same the world over. People look different, people approach each other differently. The, the, the factor of you know, body space, how much, how much space do we leave between each other? You know, body language. Um, you'll see throughout in Egypt all sorts of boisterous behavior, men holding hands, you know, which, which back in cold old England, we just don't do well. Here, in a very ostensibly homophobic society, um, Men can hold hands, kiss, hug, whatever. That, that's, you know, this is something of what makes the, the distinctions interesting. Burton, Burton picked up on this. Look, for instance, at that Muslim drinking a glass of water. In the first place, he clutches his tumbler as though it were the throat of a foe. Secondly, he wets his lips. Thirdly, he imbibes the contents, swallowing them, not sipping them as he ought to, and ending with a satisfied grunt. Within weeks of being in Cairo, he began to walk and talk like a local, and he was beginning to get it right. So much so that a newfound friend invited him into his harem and to a wedding. Burton noted how men and women here hardly mixed, even at weddings. In fact, after years of observation, he believed this part of the world was a hotbed for sexual encounters of a very unmarital kind. Although homosexuality has always been prohibited in Islam, in the Egypt of the 1850s, Burton would have found a culture where it was more openly practiced than in Victorian Britain. And he had a theory as to why. In an appendix to his translation of the Arabian Nights, he invented the Sadatic Zone. A band stretching across the world in which homosexuality was both more common and more accepted. And its causes were... Geographical and climatic. We must not forget that the love of boys has its noble, sentimental side. Walking through the streets of Cairo today, it's hard to think that you're in Burton's satatic zone. Like Burton, I wanted to dig a bit deeper. I found a massa in a weekly local paper whose ad subtly seemed to suggest the possibility of extra services. Uh, do, uh, Robert, do you uh, make a, a sex massage before? Yes. Where? In the, anywhere, everywhere. Everywhere? Not everywhere, but... Um, uh, you yeah. like a sex massage? Yeah, sometimes. You, you want this massage for your uh, muscles or you want massage for your sex and fun? Well, I don't personally want um, um, sex massage, no, but I think it's a nice idea, sex massage. Yeah. Uh, so what do, you, what do you prefer uh, in the massage? The soft sex massage or hard sex massage? What's hard sex massage? You don't know about the hard sex massage? No. This is uh, uh, maybe like intercourse in oh. your ass crack. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that's what you do as well. And how much does that cost? Uh, this is uh, very expensive. Mm. Uh, maybe 1,000. 1,000? Yeah. 1,000. What's soft sex? This is the second kind of, uh, of massage. All right, masturbation. Yeah, this is, uh, this is uh, by uh, 500. Mm -hmm. That in, in Europe, we call that happy ending. Sorry? And that's, massage, this that's massage with happy ending. Yeah. 